First of all, that, that was like the nicest welcome I've ever gotten at Rashi. I'm at Rashi all the time. Like, a lot of you guys look really familiar to me. Yeah. Do I look familiar to you? Yeah. 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 You know, my son Jeremy is in fifth grade. So I'm here for Kabbalah. Shabbat Allah. Oh, I know Jeremy. Like that. Oh, yes. I see yeah, you know Jeremy. He's real hairy. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. So it's really, really nice to, uh, to meet all you guys. and nice to be with all of you. And I'm so happy about the invitation that I got through Rashi, through Gateways. Um, it's so nice to be here. And you guys have been learning about disability and especially hearing disabilities in the last yeah, yeah. couple yeah. sessions, right? Great. So they invited me to come in and talk about mine. Now, I'm a rabbi in a temple in Wayland. Um, again, you might know some kids who, uh, who go to that temple. Like that. And I want to tell you a little bit about uh, my disability, which when you look at me, you don't see it. Right? Yeah, but like, if you talk to me for like, if you talk to me for like five minutes or so, oh, you do see it? Yeah, you're, when you're on my side? Yeah. Right? yeah. And if you talk to me for like three or four minutes, you'll start to go, oh, I get it. I get what's, what's up with it. So I'll explain that to you in a minute or two. But I also wanted to put it in a frame about disabilities in general. You said that was okay for me to do that. So this is one of my favorite books by one of my, one of my teachers. This is about disabilities in general, all different kinds. Um, let me check out this picture. I used to have a big poster of this picture in my office, but uh, I lost it when I moved. I wish I had it back, but I still have the book. Look at the lady in this, in this picture. Tell me what you think she's doing. What's she See called? what she's doing? She's rocking, rock she's rock rock in a wheelchair. In a wheelchair. Right. What's it called? What's the name of the book? The book is called Big People. It's by my teacher, Danny Siegel, who is a very good friend of mine. A very good friend with Stephanie Rotsky. He wrote it? He wrote this book. Yeah. But I'm just showing you because I want you to see that picture. What do you think of this? So this is a woman named Erin Broadbent. And she is in a wheelchair. She was in a car accident. She was in a wheelchair. And she is actually, uh, Danny told me he met her. And in fact, she's not climbing up the mountain. She's rappelling down the side of the mountain. I don't know if that makes it cooler or less cool or whatever. But that's her. That's Erin. And she's rappelling down the side of the mountain in her wheelchair. Now, the question we have to ask ourselves when we see a picture like this is, why is she doing that? And the answer, the correct answer is not because she's crazy. So <laughs> she might be, but that's not really germane to our story. Why is, uh, why is she doing that, do you think? You don't know anything about her, but you know a little about her. Make up the story. Why do you think she's doing that? Well, because she probably likes to do rock climbing or whatever. Because she likes to do it, right. And she probably liked to do it before her accident. Maybe she didn't, maybe it's something new, but she likes it. Yeah. Good, that's a good reason. Why else? Because she, she's doing it because it's, it's like a way for her to have fun. That's fun for her, excellent. And? Maybe she's showing you that she can do stuff the same, people, the same way other people can do That's a nice answer too, to show I can do that just like anybody else can, anyone who's not in a wheelchair can do it. Yeah. Maybe she's wants to like make herself think that she can do anything else or make herself motivated. Excellent answer. And why else? Maybe because she she if she if she wants to have fun because she got in a car accident, she would probably in her car going to be That's a beautiful answer. And why else? Maybe she's a because she's a daredevil. Yeah, maybe. Maybe she wanted to break a world record. They wanted to break a world record, or? Maybe she wanted to pose for a picture in a book. <laughs> she wanted to be on the cover of a book, right? Maybe yeah. she she was just doing it for fun. She didn't care what other people thought about her, and she yeah. just wanted to do it. So there's something that sums up all of these answers that everybody gave. All those answers might be right, and you probably think about it. Nobody said because it's. Um, a nice way of being outdoors in the fresh air and out in nature and stuff like that. Anybody in the room, by the way, do this? Do any of you guys do this? Ever gone like no, rock climbing or yeah. anything? I don't know. Not on a wheelchair. So you might think, think about this for a minute and say, why do you do that? Why do you do it? Now, don't answer, but think about it. Because I think the correct answer to the question about why does someone like Aaron do this is for any of the reasons that we would want to, she might want to also. And part of our job as mitzvah people, we're Rashi students here, we're mitzvah people. Part of the job being mitzvah people is to open up the world to people, whether 
in whatever way that somebody might be disabled or have a disability to open up the world for them to unlock doors for them and say, sure, you can do this. I happen to know an organization in Israel that does stuff like this for people with all sorts of disabilities, not just, not just rappelling and rock climbing, but also parachuting out of airplanes and sailboarding and going skiing on the mountains and things like that, even if you've got all sorts of different disabilities. Scuba diving, too. I've seen pictures of people scuba diving in their wheelchairs before, which is ah, mind-blowing to me. So what I really want to talk to you today is about unlocking doors and opening up the world. Um, also, um, I've seen um, a disability skier before. Yeah, you have? It's yeah, really cool. Did you see it when you went to the... Yeah, I was skiing, and they had like, um, a sign that said blind skier, and then there were two people helping so cool, right? I've seen that before too. So cool. Tell me one more. I know you got a dozen examples of this. I just want to hear one more, and then I'm going to tell you my story. What this has to do with me. It is such a cool thing. I saw them actually fall. I think it's such a cool thing to see, right? And you saw somebody fall when they were doing it. Why? Because you fall when you're skiing, right? No matter what, I've fallen lots of times skiing. So. All right, so we got the idea that part of our job, and part of the thing that's so exciting about stuff like that is our job is to unlock doors and open up the world for people, no matter what their abilities or disabilities might be. And that kind of relates to me very personally, because I came here today to tell you a little bit about mine. So mine probably already figured out, probably because of the reason why I was invited here. So I don't hear very well. I wasn't always like that. I wasn't born like that. But as I was growing up, I had a feeling that as I got older, that my hearing might get bad. You know why? Because my dad's was like that, and my grandparents was like that. Genetic. I saw that when they got a little bit older, they started to lose their hearing. What did you say? Uh, was it like genetic or something? Exactly. Exactly. Genetic. Um, so my dad, I remember when I was probably right about your age, my dad was in his mid-30s. I saw his hearing start to get worse and worse and worse, just like his parents did. And he started wearing hearing aids and, you know, kind of dealt with it. But when he took his hearing aids out, you know, you couldn't talk to him at all because he really couldn't hear you. And my dad's a, my dad's a dentist and works with people all the time, all day long. And he really needs to be able to have conversations with people and hear them. So it was, it was hard for him. But he got his hearing aids, and he deals with it. Then there's me. So I was like in my mid-30s, and hearing is a big part of my job. Because I know you know about rabbis, right? Yeah. Part of what rabbis do is they spend a lot of time teaching in a classroom like this one. Part of what rabbis do is they sit with people in their office one-on-one -on -one and talk to them about the problems that they might have. Sometimes I visit people in the hospital and sit and talk with them over the hospital bed. One of the things I realized at a certain point was I was straining a little bit. It was getting harder and harder for me to hear what somebody was saying. I started saying what a lot and, and things like that. I said, uh-oh, this is what I saw happen to my dad when I was a kid. I also saw something else. Um, that was, oh, the other thing I was going to tell you is I don't know about you. For me, one of my favorite things in the whole world is music. I love music. I love listening to music. <laughs> Good, you're with me. I see that. So I play a little bit of music, but more than anything, I love to listen to music. And when that got harder and harder for me, that started to get a little scary for me as well. And then I had one, so I saw this happening, and then I saw one day, I was 36 years old. I remember exactly exactly the age my dad was. And I was sitting in the front row of my temple. We had a guest speaker from Israel who was talking. And he was standing up on the beach talking into a microphone. And everybody else was listening. And I realized I was sitting about as far away as you guys in the front row are from me. And he was talking into a microphone, stuff like that. And I realized I wasn't hearing three quarters of what he was saying. It was the first time it really hit me that I was in a, a classroom and wasn't hearing the music. I gotta be honest with you, it scared me a lot. Actually, I went home and cried a little bit because it was really scary to me saying, wow, what's gonna, uh, what's gonna happen to me? How much worse is this gonna get? It was a very scary moment. But that was also the moment where I decided I was gonna go to a doctor and get it really checked out. So I felt sorry for myself for a little while, but then I went to the doctor. The doctor told me one or two things when he said, yeah, you really lost a lot of your hearing. And I said, the first thing I said to the doctor was, 
you have to tell me something really straight. Because all of you guys went like this. Um, I said, did this have anything to do with the iPod or playing music really loud in the car or things like that? And the doctor said to me, it has nothing to do with those things. Now that doesn't mean you should play really loud music on your headphones. Right? Yeah. yeah. You probably shouldn't do that. No. But he said to me, it has nothing, your hearing loss has nothing to do with those things. You just have bad genes. They came from your dad and your grandparents and you're stuck with it and it's gonna get worse. But we're gonna give you hearing aids. So that was around the time I started wearing these guys in my ears. When you Who, took you it out? Oh, you didn't even notice. I didn't. Did you take it out? Were on my side. Wait, is that the actual hearing aid that, do you just take that out? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, it's like that. Like a pair of glasses you might take I on and take off. I, I, I heard them. them. See mine? Oh, yeah. I, I should have asked at the beginning. Is there, I see there's a couple of you guys in the room who wear glasses. I wear contact lenses, but some of you guys wear glasses. Anybody in the room wear a hearing aid? Anybody in the room have a parent or grandparent or a good friend who wears one? I have a grandparent. So, My grandparent. Right. Okay, put your hands down. Um, so, something amazing happened when, oh, and by the way, these little things, like a pair of glasses, pair, glasses aren't cheap. Your parents have probably told you that before. Glasses cost a couple hundred dollars to get them. These little things in my ears, each one of them costs a couple thousand dollars. What? They're really, really expensive. And there's a lot of technology inside them. When I go to my doctor, he takes them out of my ears and puts a cord in and plugs it into his computer to adjust kind of the sound of it, which is kind of neat. But they are not cheap. They're really, really so expensive. Um, so for what that's, what that's worth. I thought you might be interested in that. I don't know why. Um, let's see. So I started wearing them. And, and they're pretty good. They're not perfect. You know, when you put on your glasses, I bet you have perfect vision. Right, pretty much. Um, when I put them in the hearing aids, they make me able to function. Because really, I wasn't. I, if I took them out right now, like I just did, I couldn't have this conversation with you. I, I'm not totally deaf, but I couldn't have this conversation with you. It would be that bad. So I wear them, and we're able to do stuff like this together. But then I started doing something else, and this is the thing I really wanted to know. Something amazing kind of happened. Because I have kind of a public life. I teach in the temple, and I have lots of students, adults and kids, and everything in between. And uh, this is what I do all the time. So I started doing something interesting. First of all, I started compensating. You've probably already seen that I've done this a little bit. When I'm in the classroom and somebody starts asking questions or we're having a conversation, what did I do? When, when, when you made your comment before, what did I do? That, I do that all the time. I come over and say, yeah, what's, it, what's the answer to my question? Like that, and I move around the classroom all the time. That's not just because I'm antsy or on focus or anything like that, it's because I really, it's hard for me to hear if you're on the other side of the classroom and I'm over here. So that's one thing I do. Um, what else do I do? I realized I started sitting in different places in the classroom. If, um, if I was teaching in your class I, and we were all seated around desks, I probably wouldn't sit at my desk in the front of the room, but I'd probably put my desk somewhere over here where I'm kind of in the middle of everybody. So I'm a little bit closer to everybody to talk. I do two other things that I want you to know about. And all of you guys raised your hand saying you know hearing impaired people in your life. So I want you to know this. I want you to remember this when you, when you interact with them. I often start conversations with people when I'm meeting somebody for the first time and I say, hi, it's nice to meet you. I often say, listen, before we get started, I want you to know I don't hear very well. So will you do me a favor and just kind of speak clearly for me? I find myself saying that all the time. Um, what I don't do, not yet at least, is I don't read lips and I don't do sign language. I don't find that I need to do that yet. But maybe in 10 years, if my hearing gets a lot worse, maybe I'll need to do that and I'll be ready to do that. But I don't do that now. Um, what else did I want to tell you about that? Then I want to tell you the most amazing thing that happened. And maybe this is really the reason that my friends at Gateways wanted me to come in because here's what really happened. I start, when this first started happening to me, I started feeling bad for myself. I felt sorry for myself. I got a little bit scared too, like I told you before. I said, boy, in 10 years from now, am I gonna be totally deaf? What's, what's that gonna be like? And then at a certain point, I stopped feeling sorry for myself. And I started talking about 
I started talking about it in the classroom. I started talking about it with kids. I started talking about it with adults. I started writing about it. I started talking about it from the Bema, like at Shabbat services. I would give sermons about what it feels like to be hearing impaired or have a disability. Just let me finish the sentence. And the most amazing thing happened. People started coming to talk to me about it. People started making appointments to come see the rabbi and sit in my office and say, listen, I've been denying this for a long time, that my hearing has been getting worse and worse. And then I heard you tell your story. And I want you to know, and then they start crying. I say, I want you to know I made an appointment with a doctor. And I've been lying to myself for 10 years and not doing it. And thanks for saying what you said, because I'm going to go do that now. But then something really, really, really amazing happened. Other people, including kids, started coming to talk to me, and they weren't talking about hearing, they were talking about other disabilities. I had people come to me and say, you know what, I, uh, I don't read so well. I try as I might, it's really hard for me because I discovered that I'm dyslexic. And that I, it means you don't process words oh, in a usual way, but in an unusual way. Yeah? And other people said, you know what, I have a hard time with math, the numbers, don't uh, add up in my head so easily. Or I have other kinds of learning disabilities. Or I'm ADD or something like that. Anyway, my point is people came and talked to me about it and said, because I said, I've got my problem. They felt comfortable saying, well, you know what? I got my own problem too. And I learned that everybody's got some sort of disability in some sort of way. And what you have to do is say, this is me and it's okay. God made me this way, and I have to not feel sorry for myself, but I have to celebrate myself. This is my thing. I deal with it. And one of the things I learned from this is everybody's got something that they have to deal with. Maybe your hearing is great, I hope it is, but maybe your eyes don't work well, or maybe your body doesn't work so great, or maybe, um, Maybe it's harder for you to learn in ways that the kid sitting next to you in class learns, or whatever. And my message to you I want you to take away today is, that's okay. Everybody's got something. And you don't have to feel sorry for yourself. You don't have to feel bad for yourself. And uh, we all learn to overcome these things and be the best people that we are, the way God made us. The second thing I want you to take away from this conversation is this. If you, almost all of you raised your hand and said you got somebody in your life like this who, who doesn't hear so great. What you have to do is you have to know how to be sensitive to those, to those people. You have to speak clearly. You have to, uh, my, here's something my kids had to learn. They had to learn that uh, if I'm in this room and they're watching TV in the next room and they go, hey dad, I don't hear it. <laughs> right? Dad. And it's really hard to hear somebody coming from the, from the other room. I say, we don't work that way in our house anymore. You can't yell from the, or from the basement upstairs or from the other room. You have to come into the room to talk, to talk to each other. And most important, to speak clearly and speak loudly. And not to get frustrated if somebody says, I didn't hear you, can you repeat yourself? Those are things that you have to know about how to uh, work with people who are hearing impaired. And, uh, those are the most important things I want to say. I guess I also want to say thank you. I want to say thank you to your teachers and to Rashi and to Gateways, and especially for, for um, letting me come in and have this conversation with you. I got to be honest with you. I talk about this a lot in the temple. I talk about it in the Bema. I write, I've written about it. But this is the first time I ever came in just to talk about this before. And you guys made me feel really good. So thank you for that. And do me one other favor. If you see me around the halls in Russia, you see me at Kabbalah Shabbat, come and say hi. Thank you. Yeah.